Those that can, do, and those that can't, talk about it. Hello, I'm Murray Walker. <laughs> It's over the line together, and it's almost a dead heat. It's Jackie Stewart. Bernie, it's some 17 years since you bought McLaren. You've had some good times and you've had some bad times. What do you remember best? I don't remember by McLaren. Well, hello and welcome to the frozen south. And let me say straight away that it's practically a miracle that this meeting is on. This is round 14 of the 16 race world championship and the end of the European season. <laughs> now, for real spectacular driving, watch this. And nearly that's it. There's a big body job to be done. Now he's getting aboard and now, now that's it. That's it. Bang, bang and off. Off. Oh, dear. <laughs> You've got an enormous bump on your head. Can you, can you let them see it? I don't know earlier. Right up there. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> We're out of control. We can't stop. <laughs> now, as the race starts, my regrets, we must leave Brands Hatch. Join us again at quarter to five. Welcome to my personal tribute to my Formula One greats. Now, I've deliberately confined myself to 10 of them, and frankly, they've been mighty difficult to choose from the hundreds of men who've taken part in Grand Prix races over the years. And until I get to my top three, I haven't even attempted to rank them, because frankly, it's so difficult with 50 years of racing, different men, different cars, different circuits, totally different circumstances. But I'm going to be talking to Sir Sterling Moss, Sir Jackie Stewart, Nigel Mansell, Nicky Lauda, and Michael Schumacher. And what a fantastic backdrop. The Festival of Speed here at Goodwood. A veritable feast of motor racing nostalgia where everyone has a wonderful time. So let's step back in time and remember our first Formula One great, who was Italy's greatest ever, Alberto Ascari. Plump, dapper and charming, he dominated Grand Prix racing in the early 50s, driving for Ferrari and Lancia. Amazingly, Ascari is still Italy's only true great champion of the Formula One era. In his pale blue helmet and pale blue sleeveless shirt, he was a supreme stylist. Always more comfortable at the front of a race, he preferred to dominate. And once he was in the lead, his calm, unruffled style made it all look so easy. He was the son of a great driver of the 1920s, Antonio Ascari. Alberto idolized his father and was only seven years old when Antonio was killed in the 1925 French Grand Prix. It left the young Alberto with a burning ambition to emulate him. And by the time he was in his teens, he was racing motorcycles and honing his skill and racecraft. Helped by his mentor Gigi Villaresi, Ascari joined Ferrari. In 1950, the first year of the World Championship, Farina took the title for Alfa Romeo, but in 1951, Ascari beat Fangio's Alfa to win at the Nürburgring and Monza. In 1952, he and Ferrari began an extraordinary two-year domination of Formula One. For over a year, no one except Ascari won a world championship round. And to Alberto Ascari, a further Grand Prix victory. A victory which was to confirm him champion of the world a second time. But at the end of 1953, he fell out with Enzo Ferrari and joined Lancia, who were developing a revolutionary new Formula One car. In career terms, it was a bad move, because the new car wasn't race-ready until late in the season. 
But for 1955, Valencia looked a winner, and Ascari was leading at Monaco when drama. Tremendous excitement. Ascari has overshot the chicane. The car has somersaulted straight into the harbour. Frogman standing by dive in to rescue Ascari, but his blue helmet pops up over to the left of the point where the car went in, and he starts to swim towards one of the yachts. He is transferred to a stretcher and taken to hospital with little worse than a cut nose and a severe shaking. Ascari's miraculous escape was tragically short-lived. Four days later, testing a sports Ferrari at Monza, he crashed and was killed. Alberto Ascari was mourned by the whole of Italy. More than any other driver, he had created the legend of Ferrari, which endures to this day. It was a tragedy that, like his father Antonio, Alberto Ascari was killed in a racing car, just as he was coming good with Lancia. Sterling Moss, then a boy wonder, was one of his rivals and later became a member of the legendary Mercedes-Benz racing team and one of my all-time heroes. In versatility and sheer talent, Sterling is the greatest racing driver Britain has ever produced. In his 16-year career, he did 529 races and won 212 of them, an incredible 40%. He'd race anything. Formula One, Formula Two, sports cars, GTs and saloons. They called him Mr Motor Racing and whatever the event, he always raced to win. Now once you get in the cockpit, boy, you're thinking of one yeah, thing. Yeah, you know, you're looking yeah. at your instruments, then you're watching the flag yeah. and then you're off. And it's, it's a thing about one man against another man. And that to me, the interest of racing is, is the, the mental battle. Brands Hatch really comes into its own on bank holidays. Well. Even if the girls don't like motor racing, give them something to eat. It keeps them quiet. He started winning as a teenager in Formula 3 Coopers and moved on to Formula 2 with HWM. The patriotic Moss wanted to race only British cars, but the lack of a suitable Formula 1 car forced him to buy an Italian Maserati and paint it green. He beat the works cars, so Maserati hired him to lead their team. And in the Italian Grand Prix, until an oil pipe broke, he'd been leading even Fangio. Go, 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 go. So Mercedes boss Alfred Neubauer hired him as number two to Fangio. Sterling spent the 1955 season following in the great man's wheel tracks until an historic moment at Aintree in the British Grand Prix. Sterling beat Fangio that day to become the first British driver to win his home Grand Prix. I have to ask the question. You were wheel to wheel in the two Mercedes Benz the whole time. You crossed the line together. You were ahead. Did he let you through? I don't know. I asked him. Look, our team, our team orders at Mercedes were you could you race as you want to until you're 30 seconds ahead of the rest of the field. I thought, now I'm in the lead, I'll go like hell. I come around the last corner. I tread flat on the accelerator, I pull over, wave him past. No, he can't take me. We cross the line like that, one, two. I don't know whether he... He never I, said. No, he didn't. I asked him. He said, no, no, no. He said, it was your day, the British Grand Prix, you were driving beautifully, blah, blah, blah. A true gentleman. A, a wonderful man. After another spell with Maserati, there was finally a British Formula One car worthy of him, the Van Wall. In 1957, Moss won the British Grand Prix, the first championship round ever won by a British car. The Van Wall was quite a difficult car to drive. It was fast and I had a go, and uh, we managed to do it, and it was a big day for us. I'm very pro-English, for it to be an English car. Vanderbilt, of course, was thrilled, as you can imagine. It was a pretty emotive time. In 1958, Sterling won four Grand Prix, but three times the Van Wall broke when he was leading. Mike Hawthorne won only one round, but even so, Moss missed the title by one point. You insisted on driving British. Have you ever regretted that? Because you might have done even better. Oh, oh I think I would have done. Yeah. But no, no, no. I mean, I'm British. I love England. It's the centre of the world. Uh, green was the colour I wanted to race with and England was the country I was representing. I have no regrets at all. When I lost the title to Mike the first time, I was very, very disappointed. I thought, well, because I felt I could beat him. Second time I was disappointed. Uh, but then you get used to it. And then I thought, well, what's it matter? If I'm the guy they want to beat, if, they, if when practice comes in they say, well, let's see what Moss has done, if that's the thing that mattered, then, then that made the thing for me. 
After Van Wall, Mostro for privateer Rob Walker with seven more brilliant victories, including beating the shark nosed Ferraris at Monaco in 1961. That was, my, I think, my best circuit race. The reason I say that, it was 100 laps. I happened to have got pole position. And if I'd done the 100 laps at the same speed as I did pole, I'd have only been 40 seconds quitter. Um, so that gives you an idea of the pressure. Mm. I'd start a lap, Murray, and I'd say, I'm going to try and do a perfect lap. And that's how I forced myself right through all those laps, still at the back of my mind, thinking, well, these damn Ferraris can come up. It was a classic Moss victory, the underdog in the privateer's car beating the all-conquering works teams, and the public loved him for it. But at Goodwood on Easter Monday 1962, fighting back after a long pit stop, Sterling had the shocking and still unexplained accident that ended his professional career. He nearly died and after a long convalescence announced his retirement. Now, Sir Sterling, he's still as popular as ever. To me, Sterling Moss, who never won a world championship, was better than most of the ones who did. I think he was the greatest all-rounder ever. And so, from an English legend to a Scottish one, Jim Clark, a quiet Scottish farmer who, like Moss, was incredibly versatile and, on his day, unbeatable. Jimmy had no desire to be rich or famous. He just loved driving cars fast and turned out to have one of the finest natural talents of all time. Clark never seemed to have an off day and didn't argue or complain. He just got into the car he was given and drove it faster than anyone else. His early efforts in Scottish club racing were just something to do in his weekends off from the farm, but they attracted the attention of Lotus boss Colin Chapman. Thereafter, he never raced for anyone else, and the working relationship between Jimmy and Colin became one of the most successful in motor racing history. The superb climax-powered Lotus 25 and 33 gave them two world championships, and the brilliant 49 was to become another world beater. But Jim's career wasn't all plain sailing. In the 1961 Italian Grand Prix, he collided with Ferrari star Wolfgang von Trips. The German and several spectators were killed, but Clark was blameless. In 1962, after a great fight with Graham Hill and BRM, he seemed set for his first title until the final race in South Africa. When he was way out in the lead, a loose sump plug leaked oil and the title was gone. <laughs> But in 1963, he was indomitable, with seven effortless victories in the elegant Lotus Climax and became undisputed world champion. I started as an amateur. There was no idea or no intention of uh, becoming world champion. But uh, it was, I was curious to find out um, what it was like to drive a car fast, to drive on a certain circuit, to drive a certain type of car. By now, Clark was looking at other classes of racing, helped by Ford's hunger for motorsporting credibility. With the Lotus Cortinas, Clark devastated saloon car racing. And then Chapman took Clark to the Indianapolis 500. At his first attempt, he shook the American establishment by finishing second. And in 1965, came victory. Jim Clark crosses the finish line to win the 500 with a comfortable lead of more than two minutes. The same year, he won his second world championship, and his hometown of Duns in Berwickshire gave him a hero's welcome. The Ford Cosworth DFV engine arrived in mid-1967, and around it, Chapman built the new Lotus 49. Clark scored its first four victories, and 1968 seemed bound to be another championship year. He led the opening round in South Africa from start to finish. It was his 25th Grand Prix victory, breaking Fangio's long-standing record. But that April, in a minor Formula 2 race in Germany, when a rear tyre deflated at 150 miles an hour, even Clark's superhuman skill couldn't save him. His death shocked the world. That the greatest driver of his time should die in a minor race seemed unbearably tragic. 
It was a tragic loss, but Jim Clark's life overlapped that of another great Scottish driver, Sir Jackie Stewart. I regard Jackie as the ultimate professional, because not only was he a great driver who won no less than three world championships with Ken Terrell's team, but he made an enormous contribution to safety in Formula One. With his fashionable clothes and long hair, Jackie looked like a rock star. But behind the image was a total concentration on what it took to win races. Jackie could have been a clay pigeon shooting champion. As a teenager, he reached Olympic standard and he still shoots for fun. In 1964, Ken Tyrrell spotted Jackie's talent and hired him for his Formula 3 team to begin a unique relationship. I certainly would not be here today if it weren't for Ken Tyrrell. Um, he always gave me the best mechanics, the best engineering, the best equipment, um, and he cared for me better than any man could have cared for a driver. But BRM were the first to sign him for Formula One, and in his first year, he won at Monza and finished third in the championship. A brilliant debut season. Then came a terrible crash at Spa, with Jackie trapped in the wreckage, soaked in fuel. He recovered quickly, though, to begin his mission for greater racing safety and follow Jim Clark to the Indy 500, where he came very close to winning. Indy was something I knew nothing about. Um, I had only seen horror pictures of the biggest accidents the world has ever seen. I thought I'd better go and look at it and maybe try a car to see if I could do it because it kind of specialised, yeah. there was no question. And I just went out there and drove basically by the seat of my pants. Of course I found the walls threatening because you were exiting at very high speed and having to commit to the exit very early on. With eight laps to go I was two laps in the lead um, and I had an engine blow up. It was a disappointment. One of the greatest races of all time, in my opinion, was the German Grand Prix, 1968, which you won with a splinted wrist in appalling weather. Uh, maybe my best race ever. Uh, certainly biggest challenge. I, I think the fact that there was so much fog, uh, so dense, that my knowledge of the Nürburgring, even though some people may have driven it more often, I was totally confident about where I was going over rises and out of sight corners. I think that helped me. I had good tyres, I had a good car, I had terrific preparation, and I sort of stayed out of trouble. I never did a lap at the Nürburgring that I didn't have to do because I was right up to here and the your, fear of it was enormous. Your recall really is astounding. The British Grand Prix 1969, another fantastic race, and Jochen Rint was the man you were racing against. Yeah, it was one of the best races, I think, in, in, in motorsport um, yeah, for quite um, a long time. Yeah. The race with Jochen was a fantastic race. Going down uh, Hangar Straight and would overtake me going into Stowe. Now, there was no point in me trying to stop him because he was going to do it, so I would back off and let him through. And then I would do the same to him from club up to, to Woodcott. Funny thing happened, one of his rear wing end plates came undone and was rubbing on the tire. And I thought, oh my God, because it's like a razor edge at that speed, a piece of metal alloy. I'm going past him, going down Hangar Street, pointing with this hand to, to Jochen, who's looking at me. Look at your rear right wheel. Whether he could have seen it in the mirror, I'm always not sure. But it was, for me, one of the most important races I ever won. In 1969, Jackie won his first title in Amatra. And at Monza, two-tenths of a second covered him, Rint, Beltoise and McLaren. It's over the line together. And it's almost a dead heat. It's Jackie Stewart. For 1970, Tyrrell was building his own car, but until it was ready, used a march. Tragically, though, Jackie's friend, Jochen Rintz, died at Monza, becoming posthumous champion. In 1971, the Tyrrell was unbeatable. Ken's team was working perfectly. Jackie took his third Monaco win and his second title. He was runner-up in 1972 and champion again in 1973. 
But tragedy struck the Tyrrell team at Watkins Glen with the death of Jackie's close friend and number two, Francois Sever, who was destined to be his successor. Francois died on what would have been my 100th Grand Prix. Uh, and he died the day before. And I withdrew in respect to him and Ken, of course, withdrew the other car as well. And it was a sad way to end my career, but it only confirmed to me that I had done the right thing. Jackie Stewart made his name and won all his three world championships with a team owned by another all-time great, Ken Tyrrell. Ken was in Grand Prix racing in good times and bad times for over 30 years, and he never gave up. He was a truly great man. Now, this car is the 1971 Tyrrell. It was the first real Tyrrell, and it was designed by Derek Gardner in secrecy, and like most of Ken's cars, was powered by a Formula One Ford DFV V8 engine. But if you think this car is interesting, have a look at this one, because it is an example of Ken Tyrrell's amazing courage, determination, and innovation. It's the only six-wheel Formula One car that's ever driven in a Grand Prix. Now, the reason for those four small wheels in the front is to enable the car to slip through the air more easily and to be able to put more rubber on the ground for better steering and for better braking. Now, a man who raced against Ken's cars for 13 years was Austria's greatest ever Grand Prix driver, Niki Lauda a man of amazing grit and determination. Added to that were a razor-sharp brain, total self-confidence, and the ability to ignore criticism. He joined Ferrari in 1974 and immediately set about harnessing the team to his own ambition and capacity for hard work. Well, I came from BRM, basically, which was a good car. So when I joined Ferrari at the end of 73, and we together worked really hard to make that car better. And I think I won my second Grand Prix, my first Grand Prix in my life. And from 74 on, we were just going like hell. In 1975, Lauda won the World Championship with five victories. But a year later at the Nürburgring came the fiery accident that so nearly killed him. Several brave drivers dragged him from the flames, but he wasn't expected to live. When I came to the hospital, you know, you, you feel like kind of very you very you feel like you are very tired, and you would like to go and sleep. But you know, you know, it's not just going sleeping; it's something else. Incredibly, he was racing six weeks later, but at the final round in Japan, Nikki voluntarily retired. Now, you're an unusual chap in, in, in many ways, and one of the ways in which you've been unusual is to have the strength of character in 76 to say at Fuji, the weather conditions are ridiculous. You could have won the World Championship if you hadn't driven out of the race. Absolutely right, but I did come there after nearly being dead at the Nürburgring, so I just was not prepared to take the chance under these terrible weather conditions, if you do remember. Yes, yes. If I would have known the rain would stop, yeah. which was not the case in the beginning, because the problem there was that for about four hours we delayed the race, all of us, because rivers were running over the circuit. And we, did, we all said we can't race. It was so bad. Half an hour later, the rain stopped. The race got a little better. And James, in the end, finished, I don't know, fourth or something, and won the championship by one point. But from my point of view, it was a year where I had my accident. I was happy to be alive. OK, I lost one championship by one point, but I don't think I did that bad at all. 77, you won the championship again, and then you left the team that you had made and joined Brabham. Why did you do that? Uh, the reason was that 76, after I rang Ferrari from Fuji and told him what I told you Enzo now, Ferrari. Enzo Enzo Ferrari. Ferrari. Yeah. I told him uh, it was pretty obvious that he said, OK, I accept your decision. I'm fully packing you up. I didn't lose the oh, race because yeah. I was a chicken in Fuji. Yeah. I lost the race right. because I nearly killed myself in yeah. a Ferrari. And then Bernie came along and offered me a drive in the Brabham Alfa Romeo, which was the opposition, and therefore I left. And, and in the end, looking backwards, it was a mistake because I could have won more championships maybe oh, with Ferrari. We all make mistakes. When did you first know about the Brabham fan car? 
Radon Fenka, I was told by Gordon Murray when he came up with the idea. Yeah. And I remember very well the first test we did in Branch Hatch with it, the small circuit. And I was astonished when they warmed the car up and the car went boom, 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 boom. <laughs> so said, what the <laughs> hell is going on here? When the race started, I couldn't believe it. I could pass everybody around the outside, <laughs> took the lead and won the race. Lauda won the Fan Car's only race and at the 1979 Canadian Grand Prix sensationally walked away from the sport. Just before practice started in Montreal, he talked to Jackie Stewart and possibly some of the reasons for his decision were already in his mind. As long as you are in motor racing, it's more boring in this in one way because you know all the people, everything is, everything is the same all the time. And it needs special motivation. You know, like, if you start when you're 25 years old or 22 years old, you start motor racing. The motivation is there because you want to get in, you want to know everything, you want to win and all that. So if you know everything, you have won a lot of races. You always need new motivations to bring the, the, the push-up you need to be successful. So, no more driving Bernie Ecclestone's Brabham's. For two years, Nicky concentrated on building up his own airline, a whole new challenge. So you start the airline, you're out, you're out of racing, 81, 80 and 81. You join McLaren and you said, I will win my third race. And you won your third race at Long Beach. So first of all, I wanted to see after two years, can you drive again? Because I retired because I was fed up driving. Yeah. And suddenly I won the, the third race, Long Beach. So now everybody was running after me again. They'd say, oh, we must sign you up for three years. Said, Listen, sign me up for this year. You didn't want to sign me up for this year, but if you want to negotiate next year, you have to pay more money. You won your third championship at Portugal, and I interviewed you and Alain, uh, and you won it by very clever, crafty tactics during the race. Yeah, yeah tactics, I wouldn't say it. My problem was, Frost always outqualified me because he could handle better the boost increase for one lap at the time, we had 1,200 horsepower for qualifying and 600 for the race. And what nobody knows, after two laps, I had my right turbocharger break. So I was stuck in traffic, like you do not believe. The only thing I told myself clever before the race, Nicky, do yourself one favor today. Don't you do a mistake to break your wing, touch a car, drive with your head. Yes. And this is what I did. I didn't take any chances out breaking and doing stupid mistakes in the panic of, of going for a championship. And thank God, then when Mansell retired with his brake problem, yeah, yeah. I finished second and there I was. There are very few people in life who've overcome the problems that Nicky Lauda has. But to this day, he's maintained his quirky sense of humor and he's a great bloke to be with. So is the man that he beat to the 1984 World Championship by half a point. Alain Prost. They said he was boring to watch, and he was certainly unobtrusive, but he got the results. Prost's deep thinking, intellectual approach to racing covered everything. Strategy, tactics, politics, inch perfection on the track. They called him the professor. He started winning as a teenage carter, and from there quickly graduated to Formula Renault and then Formula Super Renault. He won titles in both and went on to become Formula 3 champion of France and of Europe. In 1980, McLaren snapped him up for Formula 1, but a year later, he moved to Renault. In three seasons, he won nine Grand Prix, including his home French Grand Prix twice. But the pioneering turbo cars were unreliable and he lost the 1983 championship when his Renault failed in the final round at Kyle Army, handing the title to Nelson Piquet and Brabham. His patriotic patience was exhausted and he went back to McLaren. In 1984, there were seven wins, including the last round in Portugal, but yet again, it wasn't quite enough for his teammate Nicky Lauda pipped him for the title by just half a point and paid him a graceful tribute. What do you have to say to Alain Prost at this moment, your teammate and compatriot all year long? He was the toughest guy to beat, as far as I know. The toughest guy, so therefore, this championship is the most important one for me. 
In 1985, it all came right. After five wins, his fourth place at Brands Hatch gave him the title at last. And just as Nicky Lauda, who is not here today, won the championship for Marlborough McLaren in 1984, so now does Alain Prost do so for the Marlborough McLaren team, and there they are. They know what they've done, he knows what he's done. As Nigel Mansell celebrated his first win, Prost celebrated his first championship, and the following year, he was champion again. It was the first back-to-back -back title since Jack Brabham's success in 1960. And Alain Prost is virtually within sight of his 25th Grand Prix, his second world championship, an absolutely superb achievement. You have seen the crowd rising to this popular little Frenchman who has demonstrated yet again that he's the driver of the day and he takes the chequered flag. He wins the Australian Grand Prix. He wins the world championship of 1986. Absolute euphoria in the McLaren pit. Alain Prost, the quiet, softly spoken Frenchman. Look at him, he can hardly believe it himself. The new world champion of 1986, Alan, what a day. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's uh, great for me that to win uh, to win this championship because I think for the last, uh, in 82, 83 and 84, I lost for one time four points, two points, half a point, and I think it's fantastic. In 1988, the great Ayrton Senna arrived at McLaren to join Alain Prost. It seemed like a dream team. In 1989, it was outright war. This collision in Japan disqualified Senna, but although Prost was out of the race, he took his third world championship. I must say it's quite difficult at the moment, having Ayrton in the team, it, it pushed me a little bit more, and I, and I don't want to push more. For 1990, Senna stayed at McLaren. Prost had had enough, though, and went to Ferrari. Yet again, they battled for the championship. Once more, it was between the two of them as they went to Japan for the penultimate round. And once more, there were predictions that it would end in trouble. Go! And Senna sprints away, but Alain Prost takes the lead. It's happened. Alain Prost has taken the advantage. Senna is trying to go through on the inside, and it's happened immediately. This is amazing. Senna goes off at the first corner, but what has happened to Prost? He has gone off too. So, bitterly and controversially, the title went to Senna. In 1991, Things went wrong for Prost at Ferrari too. At Imola, he even spun off before the start and there were no more wins. But after a year off, he joined Williams in 1993 for a magnificent final season. Seven more victories brought his total to 51 and his world championships to four. The professor retired at the top. Sadly, Alain's brilliance at the wheel did not lead to him becoming a successful team owner. But I'll never forget him as a charming gentleman and a perfectionist at the wheel. At the wheel, particularly of this car, the FW15 Williams of 1993, in which he achieved his fourth world championship. There are seven skull and crossbones insignia on the rear wing there to record those seven victories, and it was a wonderful year for Alain. But to me, the greatest Williams of all time is this one. It's the FW15's predecessor, the FW14B, which my mate, the great Nigel Mansell, drove to victory nine times in 1992 to become world champion. But Nigel wasn't only Britain's most successful Grand Prix driver, he was an inspired showman that the crowds adored, and wherever he went, there was drama. Drama that came from plain gutsiness, like pushing his stricken Lotus in the heat of the Dallas Grand Prix until he collapsed. From cruel twists of fate, or from his tremendously aggressive style when there was a race to be won. And, and, and Mansell going round the outside! Incredible! Nigel came up through Formula Ford, winning the British Championship, and then he and his wife Roseanne sold everything they had, including their house, to finance a move into Formula 3. 
the money that we'd sort of saved and, and put together in this house and the things I'd sold in seven weeks were spent, and more money, I might add, because I borrowed more money. And then after seven weeks, everything had gone. He had crashed the car and his career seemed over. But then, while he was still nursing his injuries, came an offer of a Lotus Formula One drive. He grabbed it and spent five hard seasons with the team. But for 1985, it was time to move on to Williams. We were very fortunate that uh, the Williams team, with uh, Frank Williams, um, saw uh, some of my exploits in Formula One and decided that it was worthy of uh, giving us a, a run. And we joined them, as you know, in 85. We never really looked back from that day on. I was there talking about your first win at Brands Hatch in 85. And then in 1986, you were within an ace of winning the World Championship. Thank you for reminding me. And what happened? <laughs> Wow. Um, I remember pressing the overtake boost because I was just following Alan uh, in the McLaren. We only had to come third or fourth um, in that race to be the world champion. When I pressed the overtake boost to overtake uh, the Liget, the tyre just uh, totally exploded. Hey, look at that! Out that and colossally, that's Bansel! Playing it over now all these years later, I mean, it still hurts. Yeah. It's the one that definitely got away. In all my years, the bloke that's given me the most drama and the most excitement and the greatest number of happenings is you. And 1987 at Silverstone, the British Grand Prix, mm, there was this fantastic drive back. Can you can you bring that to the front? Oh, yeah, now? I mean, just sitting here now, and I'm going goosebumps now, Murray. I mean, it's incredible. It, first of all, it's when Silverstone was a man's circuit, wasn't it? But, yeah, I mean, uh, within about three or four laps of the race commencing, I had a terrible vibration on the front of the car. And I knew I was in trouble because, I don't know why, but one of the wheel weights must have come off the, the rim. Nelson was starting to go away from me in the race. Anyway, we made a pit stop changed the tyres, I came out with about 24, 25 laps to go. And um, as you know, I broke the track record uh, something like 11 times in the last 15 laps. And I caught him with two laps to go and did the most incredible dummy down the hangar straight and jumped on the inside going on stow and obviously went on to win the race. But what people don't know, I was being told to slow down by the team. I was being told, <laughs> <Me>? <laughs> <laughs> you know, your eyesight's not real good when you're chasing. You know, you just really <clears throat> focus this way. You don't look at the board. What did Nelson say afterwards? Anything? He never spoke to me. No, he never spoke to me. Nigel missed the world title that year with this horrific practice crash in the final round at Suzuka, which aggravated an old back injury. And then, for 1989, came the call from Maranello. When you went to Ferrari, they immediately took to you. They called you Il Leone, the lion. Mm. And I, I reckon you started off on the right foot in Brazil. Because yeah, it's the, car, good, isn't it? the car was never going to finish, <laughs> was it? It was never going to finish. I mean, there, there are some miracles that do happen. And um, up until that race, the car could never do more than four laps. And I uh, took the lead. Um, and then I was real angry because I was in the lead and I was thinking, well, my car's going to pack up any minute now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how it really happened, Murray, but the car finished. We won the race, which was very historic at the first attempt uh, with a new team. And then, as you know, it was uh, something like seven or eight races later before the Ferrari car ever finished a race again. Nigel, you, you were up against uh, Senna Notum in the Ferrari. You were in the Ferrari uh, at, at Hungary. Uh, and, he, and he was going to win. He was going to. He was going to win the race. Oh, sure. no, no, no doubt question. about it. And no I question. was going berserk in the box. What yeah. were you doing in the cockpit? I just thought, wouldn't it be really neat if uh, you know we caught him on a corner and Ayrton got boxed in a little bit, enough for Ayrton to come out the power, just a moment, in which time I could get alongside Ayrton and then try to come alongside. I was already there. And Mitchell goes through. Oh, fantastic! And then I blocked him because I didn't move over. I stayed there, so he couldn't go forward. He couldn't go sideways. And it was, it was just fantastic and a little bit of luck, but opportunist overtaking manoeuvre that you've got to have sometimes. But for 1990, world champion Alain Prost joined Ferrari and Nigel complained that the team was favouring Alain. When his car broke at Silverstone, he flung his gloves into the crowd in a typically theatrical gesture and announced his retirement. It was a decision that was being thought about carefully for about the last, 
probably about four months. Certain people said to me who knew what I was going to do, oh, the timing's wrong, you know, people say it's a reaction and this, that and the other, but I've had a fantastic career, but I think for the first time in my life, I'm going to put my family and my three children first. Well, whether he meant it or not, he was lured back by the promise of number one status at Williams. He won five races to be second in the championship, although there was more Mansell drama in Canada when he was leading on the last lap. He's taking the hairpin very... He's stopping! Nigel Mansell, just a few hundred yards from the flag on the last lap. He's stopping, he's banging his steering wheel in frustration. It looks as though he's out of the race. But there was no repeat at his beloved Silverstone. Nigel Mansell wins the British Grand Prix for the third time in his career. You don't need me to tell you how happy he is. He even gave his old rival Ayrton Senna, who'd broken down, a lift back to the pits. Nigel, there is one television shot of all time that sums up the drama and the excitement and the speed and the danger of Formula One. You in the Williams, Senna in the McLaren, at Barcelona going down to turn one. Neither of you was going to give way. Not an inch. You know, there we were at 200 miles an hour. And, you know, and you've got to remember, if the wheels are a little bit out of sync, one or the other can fly, and that's dangerous. He wanted the corner. What he forgot was I wanted the corner. And what he forgot also was, you know, he was racing against me that day and not the others. Wheel to wheel stuff. Look at this. They're almost touching. Mansell gets in there. Mansell and Senna were as close on the final lap at Monaco in 1992. Only this time, Mansell just couldn't find a way past. Mansell closes, but it's too late. And Ayrton Senna wins at Monaco. But at last, it was Mansell's year. You are about to see Nigel Mansell become world champion of 1992. Mansell finishes, and he's world champion. And then he turned his back on Formula One and went to America. That year, you did it, and you, you got the world championship. And you then became another world champion in kart racing. Can you, can you just briefly summarise what sort of a year that was for you? It was, it was obviously a very difficult year um, because going into the winter, you know, I would have been looking forward to defending the World Championship in Formula One in the manner that I'd won it. And it was starting at the beginning again, almost. I mean, I quote Paul Newman, it was an adventure like, like you couldn't believe. The first year they were mesmerized. I'd then won three ovals on the trot. The first one at Phoenix, I had a terrible accident. And in Indianapolis, I was third. The Penske team manager come up to me uh, at the end of Nazareth, and he said, I've got to shake your hand, and uh, he said, I wasn't a believer. He said, well, I am now. He said, you're one of the greatest. In 1994, Mansell returned from America after Senna's tragic death, with four guest drives at Williams to win his final victory from his very last Grand Prix. And Nigel Mansell wins in Australia! Fantastic! Nigel was mighty in the car. That's why the Italians called him Il Leone, the lion. And I'm proud to call him a friend. But if choosing my top 10 was difficult, choosing my top three was even more difficult, and they're bound to be controversial. So, number three was Ayrton Senna. He was charismatic, intense, the master of his craft, and he lived to win. There was always a mystique surrounding Ayrton Senna. In his superhuman skill in the cockpit, his uncompromising single-mindedness and his ruthless will to win, there was an otherworldliness about him which has only been increased by his tragic death in 1994 at the... <laughs> By the time he'd moved to Britain, those skills were clear to see, and he won a string of single-seater championships. In 1984, he moved to Formula One with Tolman and was stunning in the wet at Monaco. Had the race not... Lotus signed him for 1985, and his first victory in torrential conditions again came in Portugal. It was the first Lotus win since Colin Chapman's death three years earlier. Out goes the chequered flag, and Senna has won. Look at him, both hands waving with joy. 
In 1988, Senna joined Ron Dennis's McLaren team as joint number one with McLaren fixture Alain Prost and wasted no time in trying to establish his superiority. There was no love lost between the Brazilian and the Frenchman and the battles between the two of them were sometimes too close for comfort. Senna Prost having a look and Senna's crowding him into the pit wall. That season was a McLaren whitewash, dominated by the two of them. And with eight wins to Prost seven, Senna clinched the championship in Japan. Ayrton Senna crosses the line and you can see his exultation. He knows he is the world champion. And of course... Oh my goodness, this is fantastic! Alain got out, but Senna stayed in the car, restarted and won the race, only to be disqualified. Prost was champion, but moved on to Ferrari. Back at Suzuka 12 months on, the championship rivals started side by side on the front row. Prost got into the lead before turn one, and it was impossible to avoid the conclusion that Senna simply drove him off the road. And 12 months later, Senna, already champion again, moved aside to give his teammate Gerhard Berger the victory. Ayrton won at Monte Carlo six times in seven years, but one of his most miraculous races was at Donington in 1993. This was lap one. 76 lap, went on to win by almost a lap. At the end of the season, he left McLaren at last and signed for Williams. At Imola on the 1st of May 1994, he crashed fatally at the Tamburello corner. Shortly before his death, Senna had this to say about the risks of his racing life. One particular thing that Formula One can provide you is that you know you are always exposed to danger. Danger of getting hurt, danger of dying. This is part of your life and you either face it in a, in a professional, in a cool manner or you just drop it, just leave it and don't do it anymore, really. And I happen to like too much what I do to, to just drop it. I can't drop it. For many, Ayrton Senna was the greatest driver of all time. His funeral brought Brazil to a standstill. Without doubt, he was a true superstar. <laughs> You know, one of the unanswerable questions about Formula One is how would the great Ayrton Senna have gone against Michael Schumacher when Michael was at his prime? Sadly, we'll never know the answer to that. But Michael has gone on to become my number two because he's not only an extremely nice person, he's an incredibly capable driver, he's a supreme tactician, He's got all this experience and he has this incredible ability to weld the whole team around him to go his way. I think he could well go on to become the greatest of all time. Unlike the rest of my top 10, Schumacher's still racing, so we can only assess his career so far. According to the statistics, he's already the greatest of all time. In terms of Grand Prix 1 and points scored, he's far and away the best in history. He's already equaled Fangio's tally of five world titles and seems bound to exceed it. Here's Michael. a towering driving talent with amazing car control, especially in the wet, but he's also a racer out of the cockpit. In every way, he's the complete modern racing driver, utterly dedicated to the whole business of winning motor races. He's got a reputation of being cold, arrogant and aloof, but that's a reputation with which I disagree. When he's working, which is most of the time, he doesn't like anything to interfere with his concentration. But off duty, he's always courteous and friendly. <laughs> Here we are, Michael. And he's always been a winner, even when he was just a kid in a go-kart. My father started with me 
as a young boy and he saw an old uh, motorcycle engine in, and uh, welded it on, onto the kick go kart and that's the way it started and I was obviously happy to go on the fields uh, uh, with this uh, kind of machine. And you were on the pace straight away? Well, uh, nobody could tell because on the fields there was no competition. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I was yeah, by myself, yeah. but uh, pretty soon we found out that was too dangerous. So we looked for a go-kart circuit and I competed. Well, yeah, I was competitive straight away. It was the same in Formula 3. Schumacher and Hakkinen memorably collided at Macau in 1990 as German and British champions. And Schumacher commandingly won the race, much to Mika's disgust. He beat himself there, honestly. If he would have stayed behind me in that uh, second race, he would have won the event. Uh, obviously, the get-together we, we had uh, meant that uh, I was able to win. Schumacher's break into Formula One came when Jordan driver Bertrand Gasho was jailed for assaulting a London taxi driver. I'd been watching very carefully uh, the German Formula 3 championship in which this young driver called Michael Schumacher had won. And it was a toss-up between him and an old teammate of mine, Stefan Johansson, as to who we'd give the drive to. Um, whether whatever prevailed anyway, Michael Schumacher got the job and he was the revelation and he was the darling of the crowd, of course. After that first Grand Prix, Benetton poached him to be rewarded with his first win at Spa in 1992, exactly a year after his debut. 23 years old, the youngest Grand Prix winner for a long, long time. The first win ever for Michael Schumacher, and he puts his arm out, and he is naturally elated. By 1994, the whole package had come good. Nine wins, although one was taken away on a technicality, took the championship battle down to the final round in Adelaide. Oh, out, out goes Schumacher! The German is out of the Australian Grand Prix and Damon Hill only has to keep going to be world champion of 1994, but can he keep going? Sadly for Hill, he couldn't, and it left Schumacher with the title. In 1995, he was almost unbeatable, equaling Mansell's record of nine wins in a season, one of which, at Spa, was from 16th on the grid. Then, with two back-to-back -back titles, he left Benetton for a new challenge. Ferrari, the most prestigious team of all, hadn't won the Drivers' Championship since the 1970s. There was his goal, to bring Ferrari back to glory. It matters to me how I achieve something, how I win the races, and, and I, needed, I was looking for that particular challenge. And, in the end, my, my tendency uh, was, was Ferrari because I felt they were just on, on the possibility to, to climb up uh, to the top. And I, I've, as every boy, to some degree, you, you have uh, the most respect in terms of uh, what concerns Ferrari because uh, yes. they have the biggest yes. name and the biggest yes. emotions, reputation. I wanted that particular challenge. And Schumacher goes through! The team's revival began almost at once. In his first five races for Ferrari, Schumacher was on the podium three times and brilliantly won his seventh in the rain in Spain. And Michael Schumacher wins the Spanish Grand Prix after an absolutely superlative drive. In 1997, the championship came down to a fight between Michael and Williams driver Jacques Villeneuve. And once again, there was a collision between the title protagonists. Out goes Michael Schumacher! That didn't work. That didn't work, Michael. You hit the wrong part of him, my friend. An FIA inquiry blamed Schumacher and took away his second place in the championship. In 1998, he lost the title race to McLaren's Mika Hakkinen. And in 1999, he missed out again when he broke his leg in the British Grand Prix. Then, as the new millennium began, so did the peak of Schumacher's career. In both 2000 and 2001, he was champion, chalking up nine more victories each season. And in 2002, he broke another record by clinching the championship in only the 11th round of the 17 race series. 
Michael Schumacher has done it today, and he wins his 61st Grand Prix, and he's a five times World Formula One champion. It seems Michael Schumacher will go on winning in Formula One until there are no records left for him to break. And even without those statistics, he's without doubt the greatest racing driver of his era. There's no doubt that the master of modern Grand Prix racing is Michael Schumacher. He's won more races than anyone else and he's scored more points than anyone else. He's still at the top, but he's not my number one. That distinction goes to a tubby Argentinian who was 37 years old when he drove in his first Formula One Grand Prix. He only drove in 51 Grand Prix, but he won five world championships for four different constructors. And in this very car, he won what, in my opinion, was the greatest Formula One race of all time, the 1957 German Grand Prix at the Nürburgring. The man, Juan Manuel Fangio, the greatest. Wherever the majestic music of motor racing can be heard, through the sweeping high-speed curves of Spa, past the sunlit terraces of Monaco, high on the Monza banking, one man stands out, cool and calm amid a split-second world where time is told in tents, Fangio. Fangio quite simply dominated his era. He raced for just seven world championship seasons and he was champion five times and runner-up twice. An extraordinary success rate. He was blindingly fast when he needed to be, but he liked to win a race by going no faster than necessary. There was an inner calm, a refusal to use unnecessary energy, which gave him an unmistakable style at the wheel. But he also represented a sporting ethic that's disappeared now from motor racing. He commanded tremendous respect amongst his fellow racers, and none of them had a bad word to say about him. Born of humble parents in rural Argentina, he learned his craft in the hard school of long-distance South American road racers driving self-prepared American sedans. After he'd won the 6,000-mile Grand Premio del Norte, the Peron government saw in him a potential national hero on the world stage. So they bought him a Maserati Grand Prix car and sent him to Europe in 1949. In the Maserati, he won at once, and in 1950, he was hired by the all-conquering Alfa Romeo team. At Monaco, he typically dodged a multi-car pile-up to win the race and take the trophy from Prince Rainier. 1951 was Fangio's first Grand Prix glory year. Win after win in the supercharged Alfa 158 gave him his first world championship and a hug from Alberto Ascari. Then, at the start of the 1952 season, came the one bad accident of his career in a non-championship race at Monza where he broke his neck and was out for the whole season. He returned at the height of Ascari's domination for Ferrari, driving the more fragile Maserati, and in a frantic last lap battle, beat Ascari to win the Italian Grand Prix at the end of the season. Fangio was politically astute and always drove the best car. In 1954, it was Mercedes-Benz, and he spearheaded their almost total domination for the next two seasons, winning two more world titles. Then he signed for a single year with Ferrari and was champion again, before returning to Maserati in 1957. At 46, he was still top man. Senor Fangio, to me, the greatest of your 24 World Championship victories was the 1957 Grand Prix at the Nürburgring. You led the Ferraris of Hawthorne and Collins. You had to stop unexpectedly. What can you remember of the race? On that particular occasion, we'd practiced pit stops and we'd achieved a tyre change time of 30 seconds. However, when I actually stopped in the pits on that occasion, the tyre change took those 30 seconds plus another 48. I went out onto the track in an attempt to catch the two in front of me. 
and I didn't think I had a chance. However, uh, my uh, technique was to actually go, when going into a corner, to take a higher gear than I would normally take to make up time, and gradually I was able to make up that sufficient time. I had an advantage um, because the two drivers in front of me, Hawthorne and Collins, didn't really think I was going to catch them up, but when I saw them in front of me, I went for them. Carving chunks off the lap record, he sensationally made up three quarters of a minute on the Ferraris and passed Collins and then Hawthorne in one of the greatest Formula One drives of all time. It was a sensational victory and afterwards the normally placid Fangio said he'd never driven so hard in his life and he hoped he'd never have to do so again. The following year, the master retired, living on as the revered elder statesman of Formula One, a byword around the world for motor racing genius. For me, he will always be El Maestro, the greatest of all time. So there we are, from Fangio to Schumacher and Ascari to Mansell. Over 50 years of thrills, drama and excitement from what, for me, is the greatest sport in the world. It took me from the depths of sadness to the heights of euphoria. And I regard myself as very lucky indeed to have known so many wonderful people and to have been able to tell the world about them for as long as I did. I hope you've enjoyed my travel through the magical world of Formula One. And I hope that like me, you're going to enjoy the future as much as the past. But for now, goodbye and good viewing.